Thanks for engaging this message and watching it and having a heart to learn and grow in your relationship with God. But before the message gets started, I wanna lay in front of you a couple convictions that are on my heart. Conviction number one is for those folks who go to Grace Fellowship. If you attend one of our campuses, I wanna make sure that you understand that watching messages online or on your phone shouldn't be seen as a substitute for actually attending a service. It's so important that you get to a service, you participate in the singing and the giving and even the serving as you interact with other individuals at that campus. And so we wanna make sure that you get to a campus as soon as you can. And then I also wanna share a conviction for those of you that don't go to Grace. While we love that you're engaging the teachings here, we wanna make sure that these teachings are just seen as supplementary to the teachings that you're getting from your primary pastor or your pastoral teaching staff at your church. So it's so important that you sit under their leadership and their authority and the teachings God has given them. With that in mind, I look forward to what God's gonna do in this message. Hope that you enjoy it and that God stirs your heart as you grow in your relationship with him. Well, I appreciate you taking some time in engaging this message from your home or wherever you are. We are finding ourselves in interesting times. In fact, the word that keeps coming to my mind over and over is the word surreal. Uh, I've had many conversations over the last few days where I've talked with people where it says we feel like we're in a movie. And yet, as we are living this real time with some really significant things going on, I think it's really important that we ask ourselves, what is it maybe that God wants to teach us? And so Grace as a church, I think this is an incredible opportunity in the midst of uncertainty to stop and say, what does it look like to have certain faith in uncertain times? And I've been so encouraged as I've had conversations with other pastors as they've been talking about what they're gonna do with their churches and as we've been talking about what we're gonna do with our church that we really believe that maybe God has something unique to say to us, not just to our church, but maybe to many churches, to the church at large, that maybe during this time of uncertainty, uncertainty with this virus, uncertainty in the economy, uncertainty with our future in an election cycle, uncertainty literally day to day, hour to hour, with that uncertainty, maybe what is it that God wants to say in the midst of it? And so as we have decided as a church to, to take a little bit of time away and, and serve and love our neighbors during uh, this, this just really unfortunate time, we wanna say, God, speak to us. Speak to us in a powerful way to understand what it is that you might want us to understand and, and we got to this place as a church as we were contemplating, praying through, planning a completely different sermon series. In fact, 2020 has been a doozy. Uh, we already are on our third sermon series and it's too different than what we had planned previously. And I think as that happens, it is as though God is intervening and saying, I have something very specific for you all to hear. And so as we navigate these uncertain times, uncertainty is on a global scale, literally right now, but uncertainty shows up in your life in a lot of different ways. It shows up when you are practically thinking about, will your house, your house sell? Will you get into that college? Will you make that team? Will they say yes on that date that you're asking for? Will you be accepted by people in that new place? And yet in all of those moments of uncertainty, they seem to pale compared to what we're dealing with now. But whether it's a simple form of uncertainty or a really significant form of uncertainty, we all find ourselves doing the exact same thing in those moments. And here's what it is. In life's uncertainty, here's what happens. When the ground is under your feet is shaky, when the ground under your feet is shaky and you're not really sure what to do, you start looking for something sturdy to grab onto. You start looking and saying, what can I grab that is sturdy, that will hold me up, that will keep me from drifting, from falling? And I think that's what we're doing right now as, as a, a state, even as a city, as a church, and then ultimately as a country and even as a world. What can we grab onto that will provide sturdiness in the midst of such a shaky time period? And what I wanna do is encourage us how to be sturdy people 
how to have a unique behavior in this difficult time that would actually reflect that as we grab onto the right thing, we could be sturdy in the midst of this shakiness. Now, as I think about this unique behavior, here's what I wanna say. It'll manifest itself in a very specific way for those of us that would say we're followers of Jesus, those of us that are Christians. And I wanna remind all of us that are Christians that in this time, the world is watching us. We have a unique opportunity to live amidst this uncertainty to have certain faith in uncertain times, to do it in such a way that people would pay attention. And so here's the goal at the end of this series, however many weeks it goes, or at the end of the time of this virus, through it all, how would you have lived? And here's what I would say. You would live in a way where you would fear not and you would act missionally. That you'd be able to come to a place where you fear not and you act missionally. You fear not because you know who your God is and that you trust him. And that's really what we wanna lock onto this weekend. And as we think about that, we would say, not only do we not fear, but we're able to act in a way where we're strategic, where we're on purpose, where we're serving, where we're loving, where we're actually doing things that forward the mission of God by loving God and loving people. That in the midst of uncertainty, of craziness, as everything is shaky and people aren't sure what's coming next, we would say, we're a people that we fear not, and we act missionally, but how do we get there? Because that doesn't just happen. People don't just arrive at that type of life, even Christians. You know, as you listen around, whether it's social media, even the news, maybe your friends, your colleagues, you'll start to hear people talk about the various branches that they're grabbing for to stay sturdy. The various things that they're reaching for so that they'll no longer feel shaky. And you'll hear one that, that on the surface sounds really good. It might even be something that you've said or that, that I've said to someone, but I think we need to, to look at it at a deeper level and say, what's really going on when people say this? I think sometimes when people are looking to, to find something that's sturdy amidst being in an uncertain, shaky place, they'll say this. They'll say, look to God. They'll say, look to God. And, and, and I, I left the God part lowercase on purpose, because a lot of times what I think people really mean is I just want to encourage you to have faith that everything's going to work out. It's almost like a moral platitude of, hey, just remember, everything's going to be okay. There's something bigger. It's all all right. Just look to God. But I also want to suggest that even if they mean God, like a God, like they're a theist, or you're a theist, I want to remind you of something that when people say, look to God, that's so important. But not every God is worth looking to or upon. I've said this before for many years at Grace that that just because two people are talking about the idea or concept of God, they're not talking about the same thing. Just because two people are theists, which means you believe in God, does not mean we're both talking about the same God. I would say in the midst of uncertainty, there are times where the God that some people encourage you to look to It's not a God that's even worthy to look to. I mean, let's be honest. There are people who are what's called deists. Those have existed historically in our country and around the world. And there's even some who are deists today. And what does it mean to be a deist? Deists are people who believe in God, that he created things, he wound up the world, but now he just sits back and he's not intervening in the world at all. And if those people said, look to God, I would say, why? The deist God isn't gonna do anything. There's no real help. Some people believe in a God that if they're honest, the God has no real plan for where human history is moving to, for what God is ultimately doing in the world. And they would say, look to God. And I would say, why? What is that God trying to accomplish? Why does it matter? Some would say, look to God. And I would say, does the God that you believe in even have the power to answer prayer? Does that God have any power in creation to intervene in any way? You know, there are certain groups of people in the world that believe when they say God that they believe in hundreds, even thousands, almost an infinite amount of gods. And when you look at what God they might be saying look to or pursue, the truth is that God is useless in the middle of times of uncertainty. I actually think this is where those of us who are Christians, who are Christ followers, who love Jesus, we have a chance to actually say, no, 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 really look to God like the true God, like the only God, like the God of the Bible, because that God is actually worth looking at when things are uncertain. 
And I think before we even know how to behave and before we, we act missionally and we fear not, we have to stop and we have to remind ourselves that what will get us through uncertainty, what gets us through a time like a, a virus or an economic crash or an election season or a job loss or a miscarriage is actually good theology. Theology that we grab a hold of that we say, what does the Bible actually say about who our God is and why we can have confidence in him? And what I really hope as we start this journey of navigating uncertainty is that we would back up and we would look at some of who our God is and it would give us confidence amidst this uncertainty. I wanna remind us as Christians that when we think about our God and him and him alone, that his character and his characteristics that are actually the God of the Bible, that it's just him that make him the only God worth looking to in this. It's just our God, the God of the Bible, it's his character, his mercy, his holiness, his love, his justice, his goodness, his patience, his characteristics, his omnipresence, that he's everywhere, his omniscience, that he knows everything. That when you step back and you go, he's omnipotent and he's, he's all powerful and he's, he's actually good and you put all that together, you go, that's a God in uncertainty I can look to. In fact, when you put some of those pieces together of his character and his characteristics, they, they come together in various traits or words that we use to describe this God. And one of those words is a word that I think we can, we can say sometimes in songs. We can hear sometimes someone like me say in a message, we can read about it in a book, but we don't grab hold of it and see it for all that it really is. And I actually believe it's this characteristic of God, this trait of God, this part of God's reality, his being that can help us in uncertainty, to help us have certain faith in uncertain times. And where I think we need to start when we understand our God is this idea of his sovereignty. If you were gonna look at a, a definition of what sovereignty is, it, it can show up in a lot of different ways, but, but here is really the heart of what it means to, to have God be sovereign. The God of the Bible, we would say, is this. That it means that God is the supreme authority and all things are under his control. And because of that, therefore everything happens either from his direct cause or his conscious allowance. It means that God is the authority. He's the supreme owner, ruler, controller of every single thing that goes on. You know, if I was to walk into your house and have a lot of opinions about your furniture, about your decorations, about your silverware, about your plates, you would look at me to some degree and say, I don't know who you think you are. You didn't buy any of this. You didn't shop for any of this. You didn't create the money to be able to have it. This isn't your home. I'm the one whose house this is. I'm the one who's in charge. And I think there are so many times where what we live like is that we live as though we're the ones that get to tell God how to run his thing how to go after like creation as though we rule over it. Many times we as Christians can fall prey to a man-centric God rather than what the Bible would say is a God-centric God, a God who is the supreme authority over all things seen and un unseen, all things that are created, and every single thing is under his control, which means nothing ever happens without him saying so. I'm just telling you this, and you need to believe this is something that's helpful in this season of uncertainty in our world, in your home, in our country. Nothing that is happening right now took God by surprise. Nothing. God, God's not asleep. He's not distant. He's not unaware. He's not shocked. In fact, as we really understand the sovereignty of God, we would actually have to say that for some reason, God is the one who's, who's actually allowing this. Maybe even causing this. Some of us then go, okay, well, is, is God mad at us? Is he mad at the world? Is this just the natural consequence of sin? Like, what's up? Is God out to get us? And, and I don't know. Well, we know that the Bible says in, in the Minor Prophets that we've studied as a church that sometimes God does judge people. Sometimes God does show up to get our attention. Maybe this is just a natural consequence of a fallen sinful world that God is trying to redeem creation and right now this, this virus and the things going on are just a byproduct of the world moaning to get things right again. I don't know, but what I know is that God knew it was gonna happen. That he's allowing it to happen. And you may say, well, I'm not sure that I want that God. And I would say, well, then what other God do you want? 
Because this God has the control to say, I'll allow it. I'll do things in it. I'll keep moving forward. But if you want to worship and serve a God who's ultimately not sovereign, who's ultimately not in control of all human history, I'm not sure that's a God that I actually think is worthy to look to in uncertainty. You know, as we consider the scriptures, the scriptures will tell us that in difficult times, times where it looked like evil was going on, God was actually showing up. God was actually moving forward. I want to go to several scriptures, actually more scriptures than we would go to in a normal conversation. And I want to just flesh out some of the realities about the sovereignty of God that show up in the text of the Bible. And if you were to look up the sovereignty of God, if you were to take some of the, the time that you might have in your home over the next days and weeks to, to do some research about the sovereignty of God, you'll be amazed how many scripture verses show up. I want to grab three different snapshots which get to this idea of God's direct control, power, authority, and being in our world. The first one is from a psalm, and it's, it's a, a psalmist writing a song telling us about how they feel about God. And in Psalm 47, it says this, for God is the king of all the earth. It's relating to his sovereignty, saying he is king over everything. No one is above him. He's the one that declares and makes happen. And it says, so sing to him a psalm of praise. Why? Because he's at the top. Because nothing is happening without his decree, without his approval, without him knowing, without his allowance. that He is king. He's the only one worthy to be sung to in this way. And then the psalmist continues and says, God reigns over what? The nations. Like not just your house, not just our city, not just our state, not just our country. This is saying God reigns over everything. Everything over every people group, over every tribe, over every tongue, that he is in control of them. And then it says that God is seated on his holy throne. Seated is not an accidental word. It's a, it's a word of finish. It's a word of position. It's a word of power. It's the idea that God sits there and he is unmoved. You come to him and he, you worship him and you serve him and you honor him and you love him and he declares, yeah, that will happen or no, it will not happen. You know, it's interesting when we get this vision of a king, it, it takes us to even thinking about earthly kings. And I wanna take us to another passage to think about a king who had to come to grips with this because there was a, a king over a, a nation known as Babylon. And God's people had ended up in captivity in Babylon. And, and this king couldn't have been more about himself. Couldn't have been more self-serving. Couldn't have been more about propagating his own identity, his own agenda, his own desires. And God finally said, you know what? I'm gonna get that king's attention. And it's a really incredible story in the book of Daniel that I would encourage you to read. And in, and in the book of Daniel, this king, he, he basically goes crazy for seven years. He basically, he starts acting like an animal until he comes to after seven years. And in those seven years of that king's uncertainty, of that king's craziness, of that king trying to figure things out, God gets a, a control of him. And here's the thing that the king says on the other side of coming out of him being crazy and being lost. Here are some things that he says in Daniel chapter four. He says this, at the end of that time, at the end of the seven years, when King Nebuchadnezzar came out of this, he raised his eyes toward heaven and his sanity was restored. So when he was ready, he looked up and he said, God, I'm gonna see you for who you are. Then I praised the most high. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. He begins to put God in his rightful place. His dominion is eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. He begins to look at God and he's like, God's different. God is other. God is above all things. He's the king of all kings. And then he says this about him as he continues to move forward. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. Now this probably doesn't sit with you because you're like, Keith, I was hoping like a lot of encouragement, a lot of confidence, a lot of restoration and what's going on that you'd make me feel better and you'd build me up. I'm gonna tell you right now, the best way to build you up is to build your God up. To not hold it to be about you. And Nebuchadnezzar had something click. He said, God doesn't need people. 
God doesn't need us. He's independent of us. God is above us. God is building something through us and with us, but he ultimately is not even simply for us. He's for himself. And he said in the middle of all that, he looked back and he says he does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. And then I love this. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? I doubt I'm the only person in our church that has read Twitter or looked at Facebook or watched the news or been in a conversation and thought, God, what are you doing? This seems crazy. This is not just uncertain. It seems like overblown and dramatic and nuts. And what is happening? And Nebuchadnezzar says, who are we to say this to God? Who are we even to look in our uncertainty from our mind our eyes, our ears, and question God and say, God, what are you doing? And Nebuchadnezzar, in this moment, he steps back and he goes, man, for a long time, I thought it was about me and my kingdom and my world, but I've realized it's about you, God, who you are and who, how you're moving and what you're building. I think as we think about uncertainty, I'm not sure there was a more uncertain time in all of human history and when the people who thought that Jesus was going to be their king, when they thought he was going to be the one that would save them and redeem them and bring them hope and take down Rome, and then he gets arrested after being betrayed and tried and ultimately murdered and dead. You talk about those people. Those men, those women who had followed Jesus, sought Jesus. You talk about uncertainty. You talk about how do I have faith in times where it's uncertain. They thought they had found the Messiah and then he's dead. And it's not until he raises from the dead that they begin to go, oh, we see what you were doing. And yet in the middle of telling that story, the story we know is the gospel, that Jesus would live and die on our behalf and then resurrect Peter when he's preaching And the book of Acts is gonna remind us about what was really happening in that story. As we think about this king who is seated on high that we should sing to, this king who who sits on his throne, this king who would tell another king, you're not so great. And then that king would say, no, you're the real king and I wanna worship you. And then we think about the king of kings in his situation, dying for us and what was really going on. And here's the way Peter describes that in Acts chapter two, verse 22. Fellow Israelites, this is his sermon. Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. He reminds them who Jesus is. And then he continues and he says this. This man was handed over to you, and then I love this, ready? By God's deliberate plan. There may have not been a time in human history where it looked like God was asleep at the wheel as when his son was being betrayed, arrested, killed, and ultimately suffering, saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There might not have been a time where it looked like God was distant and uninvolved and humanity was more uncertain about its future than that moment. And yet it was at that moment where God was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing. It was in on that uncertainty that it was his deliberate plan and his foreknowledge that he gave you over, and how did he do it? With the help of wicked men. Isn't it crazy to think that sometimes a good God would use bad people to do good things? That even the uncertainty that you experience of whether it is sickness, or it is somebody at the office, or it is someone in your family, that sometimes God's plan is to use people that are against you to actually grow you, to forward what he wants. And then he says, those people put him to death by nailing to the cross. But God wasn't done. See, that part of the story isn't the end of the story. It's where God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. Because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Had there been no Sunday after Friday, the story would have been terrible. But there was a Sunday. And because of that Sunday, we know that Friday was just part of the plan. I don't know how this whole situation is gonna play out in our lives, but 
maybe we should just recognize it's Friday. And it's uncertain. And I don't know what God's gonna bring the life out of it in you, in us as a church, in our state, in our country, in our world. But what I'm confident of from these passages of scripture and from hundreds and hundreds of other passages in the Bible is that when we understand the sovereignty of God, here's what we are ultimately saying. And this is why you can have hope in the God of the Bible in uncertain times. It's this, that he never leaves his throne. Ever. You and I sometimes wanna put God in a lot of other places. We want God to be significant and important in our lives in certain ways, but the heart that we have to understand about the sovereign nature of our God is that he always sits as king. He always knows, he always hears, he always sees, he always feels, he always senses, and he always acts to what is best for him because he never leaves his throne. He's always moving the ball down the field for his fame and his glory. He's always aware. There are no surprises. There are no shocks. There are no crashes in God's economy. There are no moments where the enemy gets a leg up on him in a way that he wasn't ready to do. He always has a plan. He always has the power. He is always capable. And it's because of that that when you and I stop in our lives, what you have to make sure is true no matter what it is. If it's happening, whatever it is, you can still find hope in looking to God. Whatever is uncertain, whatever the pain is, whatever's difficult, whatever you're not sure about. I thought we would have been in a different place in our lives. I thought we'd have had different things happen with the job. I thought things would be different with the kids. I thought we would have had a baby by now. I thought, I thought we'd be safe. I thought I'd never have to worry about could I leave the country and get back in? Whatever is happening, whatever you're experiencing, whatever you're doubting, whatever you're fighting, when you understand the sovereignty of God that he never, ever leaves his throne, you can have hope. Because you can look to a God who always is holding it down. There's no moment that he doesn't have his fingerprints and his hands all over, even when it seems like he doesn't. There's always hope. There's always a chance to move forward by trusting who he is. I wanna talk about how is it that we see this sovereignty of God, see that God has never left his throne in a way that would maybe give us confidence, maybe give us hope. Maybe allow us to look to God in a unique way during this uncertainty that would allow us to be certain so that we would fear not and we would act missionally. As we think about God's sovereignty that he, he's never ever left his throne and that he's always moving things forward, I, I want us to think about it in three ways as we look at God. And here's the first way that I want us to think about it. I want us to look back. I want us to look back. The passage in Psalms says, sing to God says he's king over all the earth, that he's on his holy throne, that he reigns over the nations. Nebuchadnezzar said that he's a, a God of, of generations, that he has dominion over all, that humanity is, is just something that, that he's not answerable to, that they answer to him. And as you consider that, and you consider that God never ever leaves his throne, I think one of the ways to have confidence in that is to look back and see how God's sovereignty has played out in history. I mean, we could, we could just start with some of the maybe stories that some of us know well. Had a guy building a boat for a long, long time and a flood that came down and 
literally destroyed humanity. Like you talk about uncertain times. Is, is, is humanity gonna make it? Is the world gonna make it? But we read the text and we know that God was actually in his sovereignty, in his character, in his justice, actually moving things forward by an incredibly awful and evil time. He was actually freeing humanity to be better through Noah. He gets Moses and the Israelites out of Egypt and they're heading forward and they're coming to the Red Sea and they turn around and they're about to get killed by the Egyptian army and they stand there in uncertainty. Did you just bring us here so that we could die? And it was in that uncertain moment where God showed his sovereignty and his power and he set them free across the Red Sea. We know another story in the nation of Israel's history where there was a giant who would come out and pick on the nation of Israel and all its warriors. I'm better than you. I'm better than your God. No one can stop me. And it was in the middle of that that God took a a boy who was a shepherd and raised him up and allowed him to defeat that giant so that the nation could move forward so that that kid, David, could become a king and become a great king and the nation could go forward. And somehow in that moment of uncertainty as a nation in a battle with a giant, God was actually moving the ball down the field. <laughs> Comes to a virgin teenage girl. I need to use you to have my child. A moment of uncertainty of what will the world think and how will this play out and how will I look and what's gonna go on and yet God in his sovereignty used this woman to make, and we could go on and on right down to Jesus and how in the past he was mocked and beaten and betrayed and ultimately died and, and how that looked and, and what I'm saying is is when you look back at the sovereignty of God in the past, it allows you to have confidence in the future that what he's doing is real. It's probably a crude analogy after walking through the scripture a little bit about that, but I'm actually not a half bad cook. And uh, people who have been around me for a while have come to know that, but it's interesting when I'm first with people and I tell people that I'm gonna cook, they look at me kind of funny and they think, no, I don't really want you to cook and I'm not sure you can cook. But the longer that they've known me and the more that I've cooked for them, the more when I tell them I'm gonna cook, they have confidence in what I'm actually going to prepare. And so now when I tell certain people that I'm going to cook, they, they smile with joy rather than nervousness. And the reason that they smile now is because they have history to base their future confidence upon. What I want you to do in the middle of this uncertain time is to go read Hebrews chapter 11 and to go look at the sovereignty of God in these people who were not perfect, but how God worked in really uncertain, difficult moments for his glory and his fame. What I want you to do is pick up the phone or have a conversation with another Christian and say, tell me about how you've seen God's faithfulness and sovereignty to you in the past. Where was a time where it looked like, man, it was bad and I don't know, but God showed up. Maybe what you also need to do is get out some paper and a pen and say, God, when did it feel like it was uncertain for me in my past? And yet when it looked like everybody else was doing something for bad, or this was happening to me for bad, you were actually using it for good. I want you to look back and what you'll find out is that God never ever leaves his throne and in the past, in those moments when you thought he did, he didn't. And you're on the other side now to see that he didn't. That God has always moved history for his good, even your good, if you'll look back and acknowledge it. God never leaves his throne. So if it's happening, we can have hope and we can look to this God. And one of the ways we get confidence in that is looking back and seeing how his control, his sovereignty, how unorthodox it may be, has been for our good 
and for his glory. The second looking at God that I want you to do is I want you to look forward. I want you to look forward. And I want you to be reminded of the promises that God says are still to come. God says he's going to finish his work in you personally. He says he's going to build his church. He says he's going to return. He's going to set up a kingdom. He's gonna dwell in a place where he eradicates all evil, all pain, all suffering, and certainly all viruses in the future. He says he's going to do all that stuff. And we need to be reminded of what Nebuchadnezzar said. Who who can stop it? God has a deliberate plan where he's moving all those things forward. You know, even as I give this talk, it was in just a few short days that my family was supposed to go on a spring break cruise. And so we've been navigating, were we gonna go, were we not gonna go, and were they gonna still send the cruise ship? And we were going through all those things and we had plans that we had made for months and we had sent money and we had said this was gonna happen in our future and all it took was one global pandemic to screw everything up that kept us from being able to go forward. And simply put, our plans were thwarted from something that we had planned. But what I know about my God is nothing that he has planned will be stopped. And that when you think about his sovereignty and you think about him never, ever leaving his throne, he says, if he has promised it, he will deliver on it. Which means that whatever is happening now is only a part of the story to get us where he says he's going to take us. So fear not. Don't panic. Act missionally. See that he's been sovereign in the past and he's going to be sovereign in the future. He's going to deliver on everything he said he will deliver on. God will keep his word. And if you'll keep trusting him, you will continue to be a part of seeing what he is going to do in the future. Because the Bible says not even the gates of hell can prevail against the church he's building, against the future he's preparing. So look forward. Why? Because God never leaves his throne. So you can look back and you can look forward. And the third place that I want you to look to have confidence in this uncertain time is to look up, to look up. The Psalm says, sing a song of praise that he's on his throne. Was at a movie not that long ago uh, with a friend. And my friend during the movie, he, he kept texting and like looking at Twitter during the movie. And it was like a really brilliant movie with incredible cinematography. And at one point, I got so annoyed with him not paying attention that I elbowed him. And I said, put your phone down and watch the movie. He's like, what? I said, you're missing a really good movie. I fear that sometimes in the middle of our fear, in the middle of us having our noses in our computers and our eyes glued on television screens and listening to what everyone around us is saying at us, we, we're, we're so busy looking down that we won't look up and see what God is actually doing right now still. He's still waking you up. He has still provided for you. His mercies are still new every day. He is still good. He is still worthy of praise. Get your eyes off of your phone and off of the television and look upon God. And remember, even in uncertainty, God is great. That God is still in control. That God is still good. Maybe what this this entire season of uncertainty needs to do for me and for you and for our church and for our country is to get us to look up in prayer like we've never prayed before. To drive us back to his word so we would remember and be reminded who he is. To sing songs to him as we look up at him and adore him for who he really is. Why? Because... Because not just in the past was God sovereign in doing things and not just in the future will God do great things, but he actually is doing great things right now. And I know it doesn't feel like it. 
Because we're off school and vacations got canceled and, and we didn't get to watch the tournament and, and life got real, real and real people got sick and real people lost money and what about my retirement? And in the midst of all that, stop looking here and look up. I promise you if you'll look up, you'll see that God is still good, that he has not left his throne, that he is still deliberately delivering on his plan. That he is still the God that we should never say, what are you doing to? At the end of the day, friends, what I'm saying about God's sovereignty is just to hold tight to this simple but profound and deep truth that can release you during this season of uncertainty and in any season of uncertainty. And it's this reminder, God is in control. He's in control. He's still on his throne. He still has the reins. We need to step back amidst all this and say, God, I believe that you are still with us, that you're still guiding us, that you're still moving human history forward, and that you're still worthy of all that your Bible says you are. With all this, I think there's a couple things that we need to grab hold of. One is something that we wanna just invite the whole church to join us in for the next few weeks. Something that actually will lead us right up to the Easter season. And what we wanna do is we've got about, about 28 days from the time that you'll be looking at this until Easter. And so what we wanna ask you to do over those 28 days is join us in an Acts reading plan. 28 chapters of Acts that you would read one chapter each day, that this would be an all play for our church. If you're continuing to meet in your groups, that you'd be able to talk about it in your groups, that, that we'll have some online dialogue opportunities for it. But that for all of our church, we would read the book of Acts together. And we'd be reminded that the church flourished for the people in the book of Acts during really uncertain times. That God was being sovereign even in the midst of really crazy situations for those people. And we'd look at their faith in the middle of their uncertainty. So I wanna ask all of us for until from now till Easter to, to read the book of Acts together. And then, then one other thing that I wanna ask you to do as you engage at least the next week, but maybe, maybe even every day as you read the book of Acts, that as you begin to read the scriptures, you would just pray a simple prayer. And the prayer would simply be, God, I know you are in control. And I choose to believe that. God, I know you are in control. And I choose to believe that. I believe if that sunk into our hearts, it would actually give us that whole peace that surpasses all understanding thing. I don't know if you've ever ridden a roller coaster with someone who's really scared, but it's an interesting experience. But what is very clear as they are riding that roller coaster and they're terrified is that they are grabbing on to anything they can grab onto that they think will sturdy them amidst that shaky ride. And they grab firm and they grab tight and they hold on and what they say is that thing can protect me in the midst of what feels so uncertain, so scary, so fearful. And they hold on to it for all that they are. You know, in a lot of ways, they hold on to it and it's actually an illusion of whether or not it will keep them safe. There's actually things that are much more out of their control that will actually take care of them or not. Things like who designed the roller coaster? Was it built properly? Was the maintenance done on it? But yet somehow in all of their desire to feel confident and sturdy amidst their shakiness, they grab on tight to what they think will save them. Some of us amidst uncertain times, we, we, we grab our, our wallets we grab our homes, we grab our image, we, we grab a politician, we grab the government, we grab things that we think can actually keep us safe and they're an illusion. It took one microscopic virus to bring the entire world to its knees. Grace Fellowship, I wanna remind you that there is one thing and one thing only that you can hold on to no matter what you face, and that is your God. 
and maybe more than ever, our city, our state, our country, our world needs to be brought back to the place where they recognize what they need to grab onto and hold onto is actually the only thing that can give them any security and safety at all. And it's the one who controls it all and it's God. I know it's uncertain. I know it is scary, but God has never left his throne. Let me pray for us. God, I, uh, I pray first for the folks right now who are experiencing the medical challenges connected to the sickness. Pray for doctors and nurses, nurses and researchers who are doing work to try to help us. I pray for people who have been affected economically in ways that we won't ever be able to understand or comprehend. I pray for scared parents, for scared kids for nervous politicians, for just for all of us. But my prayer, God, is not simply that you would just make it better and that it would go away. My prayer is that amidst all this, we would grab a hold of you. And not some version of you that's JV or not real, but the real version of you, the version of you that is in control that knows, that sits on his throne in confidence, guiding all of human history to where you will take it. So God, grow our faith, build our theology, and give us hope so that we would fear not and live on mission. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.